All right, everyone hear me okay? All right, I apologize for the delay. The keynote went a little longer than expected, so they moved us back. Um, so we're gonna get underway and we'll get you, everybody back on track, but I believe all the sessions uh, up until break have moved back a half an hour. So if you check the app and if you check with uh, the info desk, they'll let you know uh, what's going on schedule-wise because we are already half an hour behind. Um, so we still do have the full hour, so I appreciate uh, those of you coming out. Uh, my name is Mark Nunnikov, and I'm the principal engineer at Trend Micro. Uh, today's talk is uh, learning about how we deploy deep security as a service on AWS. So for those of you that showed up expecting a product talk, um, you know, wanted the sales pitch, I'm sure that's all of you right. I'm sorry, that's not at all what this is about. This is a story about how we, as a company, looked at one of our products and said, we can offer this out as a service, and we are gonna do it entirely on AWS. So the entirety of this service is hosted on AWS, and we, like most of you who are facing this type of a challenge, uh, you know, it was not a smooth road. Uh, we had uh, problems along the way, we solved those problems, we addressed them, um, and this story is about that. So while I'm here talking to you, um, this uh, talk is actually the cumulative efforts of a huge team within Trend Micro. Um, and I wanna thank them for letting me come and, and uh, speak in front of you. And uh, the, while I am here and it is other people's efforts, you can blame me for everything bad and they get all the good credit. So moving forward, like I said, this is our talk. So we do have to do a little stage setting. Um, deep security itself, um, it doesn't make sense to talk about the architecture if you don't know what it is. And what it is, is it's a centralized security control management platform, okay? So we provide security uh, within the AWS cloud on EC2 instances. And for, uh, you know, it is a 300 level talk, it's a lot of architecture, we're gonna go into the technical side of this. Um, it's, uh, we have two pieces to this technology. There's the manager piece, um, which is our server, and there's the agent piece, which is the client. So the agent sits on your EC2 instances and does all the heavy lifting. The manager piece sits uh, for the service within the AWS cloud, and that's where you log into the GUI, you set your policies, it does all the orchestration. So it's a traditional server client product, um, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So the agent itself does all the heavy lifting around the control set, so we do AV, uh, anti-malware, content filtering, firewall, intrusion prevention, uh, integrity monitoring log inspection. That's all done from that agent piece. And the manager is sort of the general telling them what to do. So when we went to this, and I forgive the, I forgive the uh, animations on the slides, they switch us to the old version of Keynote. But when we started this off, um, it was all about listening to our customers. And we went out and we talked to our customers and they were telling us that as they move into the cloud, they want the same security controls they have in their data center but they want it to match the speed and the flexibility of the cloud model. So you've heard this uh, all week at reInvent, how we're doing things differently in the AWS cloud. It's a lot of API based, a lot of DevOps, a lot of rapid uh, deployments. Our customers are telling us they need security that matches that. So we take that to heart and that's our inspiration. Now, a lot of you here in the audience, are you a lot of you from an enterprise background? Deal with the enterprise and you're moving into the cloud? Yeah, bit of a mix. Probably the rest of you are all pure play cloud. So for those who are pure play cloud, I'm sorry for the next slide. This is what us in the enterprise have had to deal with for a very, very long time. This is what our product looks like when it's deployed in an enterprise. And from an enterprise structure, this is nothing scary. There's a lot of boxes, there's a lot of links into other tools that are already in your data center. Um, but this is a standardized deployment for deep security when it goes on premise. And we do still offer it as an on premise product and we have a lot of success in there. And this slides in, you give this to an enterprise architect, they're okay with it. But in the cloud, it's a different story. People look at this and they're like, that's too many boxes, that's too much complexity. I wanna focus on uh, getting my business up and running. I wanna focus on that app I'm developing. I wanna focus on the game that I'm sending out to all my gamers so that I can drive business. You don't wanna worry about deploying a huge infrastructure. So when we talked to our customers, they were asking us, can we offer this as a service? Can we simplify this to match what happens in AWS? So we all went back and we sat down, we brainstormed it out. And we said, yeah, you know, that's feasible, we can do this if we host it ourselves, if we run the service, if we take this complexity and kind of just smush it together and jump down on it a bit and get it down to a simple box where the customer just needs to worry about this. We host the big red box, you drop your agent in EC2, that's it. All the complexity, all that intelligence, all that advanced controls, everything in the background is still there, but we worry about it as a service. That's what we're gonna talk about today, how we got there. So how we went from this and ended up getting it back, getting it down to this for our customers. So we look back at that quote, we moved to the cloud, we want the same security controls in our, that we have in the data center, 
and we want to match the speed and the flexibility of the cloud. That simplified model for the manager, for the service, is what enables us to do that. So how do we get there? Well, when we looked at that one statement, that really drives two types of changes to us as a product team. Um, there's product changes, and there's a lot of business changes associated. And we're going to talk about those a bit in detail, and we're going to elaborate on these. So the product ones are what's more interesting to the architecture crowd, to the, to the crowd here today. It really impacted R&D. Um, we need a faster R&D cycle. Previously, when we were focused solely on the enterprise, we were okay with yearly releases. That's the cadence the enterprise is used to. Um, they are standardized on that, and we'd match that. So we designed things, and we'd be like, okay, it was written a month ago, um, you know, and it doesn't see the light of day for 10 months after that. That's standard enterprise deployment. That doesn't work when you have a service. Um, when you have a service, customers expect that they are getting constant upgrades, that they are getting additional features and added improved product as it goes. That's the whole point of a service. So we had to change how we do R&D. We had to change how we do development. We also had to change the focus of the rules uh, within the products, so the security rules, as well as how we deploy the agents and the platforms we support, because that's different in the AWS cloud. So I guarantee, or at least I hope this works out, anybody in here deploy Solaris on AWS? No? Yeah, it doesn't happen. In the enterprise, we support that. We support Solaris and HP Unix. That's not something that you run in AWS. If you are, I'm sorry, you can see me after and I'll buy you a drink. Um, <laughs> It's just not something. So it's something where we don't need to focus development resources to support that in AWS. So that's another change that ended up being from us as a product team to figure out where we want to uh, focus our, our development efforts because we only have a finite amount of time. And also a big drive uh, here, and there's a reason there's a developer lounge in the expo, is that people want flexible and automated security. A lot of people who are dealing with security in AWS are not actually security folks. Right? So when we go into an enterprise, you have a table full of representation from every team. You've got the development team maybe at the table, but mainly it's the ops, the network ops guys, uh, the en network engineers, you get the security guys as well. Everyone has their domain. When we're talking AWS, it's normally a lot more agile, and it, there's fewer people. There's one or two guys, and they do everything. Or they have a specific focus on development and operations, and while security is a concern and it's a top of mind concern, you don't want to deploy, you don't want to waste resources that you don't have to. You want to focus on your business and delivering your target. You want to focus on that game you're developing. You want to focus on that app. You want to drive users to sign up. So we had to adjust how we treat that, because in an enterprise, we made assumptions that are no longer true in AWS. So because this is a technical talk, um, the business changes essentially boil down to we needed to walk the walk. So while our customers were asking us, how do we get into AWS? How do we do it securely? How do we do it safely? We could provide advice. We could tell them how the technology works. And that was quite effective. What's significantly more effective is when we tell them, uh, like you're going to hear today, hey, we did it ourselves. We run production workloads in it. We protect live environments for our customers from an AWS deployment entirely in AWS uh, run by a very small team within, uh, within our product team. So that's it for business. I'm, I'm an engineer. I don't talk business much, so we just go down to walk the walk. So when we stood this up, or when we started to talk about standing this up, um, we had a lot of discussions inside the company. It wasn't just assumed that we were okay, we were good to go. Um, we are a rather large global company, and we have other services that we provide to our customers from our own data centers. We have several data centers around the world that are highly secure environments. Um, just like most enterprises, we have uh, dedicated ops teams, dedicated security teams, dedicated support teams. So the first question that got raised up to us is, why aren't you doing it in our own stuff? Um, we told them exactly that last slide. We said, we want to walk the walk. We want to know what our customers are facing. What challenges are they facing in the wild? So we actually, I was surprised. I thought we'd get a lot more pushback on that. But apparently, when you tell people you want them to do less work, they're okay with that. Um, so we were happy at that. Same with the centralized ops. We have a dedicated operational team for those data centers. And again, they were very happy with that whole do less. Uh, you know, we'll do the work for you. You don't have to worry about it. And then the questions came around our product cycle. So we already touched on that a bit, and you're going to see that come up again and again, was that our enterprise product cycle doesn't work for the service. So all these discussions we had internally within R&D before even pushing out that much to the, product, to the rest of the company. But we involved our centralized ops teams, and we made sure that everyone was okay with it. We involved information security, and that's a lot of today's talk, is we're going to talk how we met our own internal security requirements, because as a security company, we do practice what we preach, and we have a monstrous information security policy. Um, and we have it for a reason, because we want to make sure that we practice what we preach out to everybody. 
and the execs. So we did involve our executives. So outside, obviously, we had immediate buy-in from our R&D executives, but we involved the larger table, and everyone was on board. So we got the okay. We got the okay to go ahead. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. This would have been a really quick talk if we didn't get the acceptance. But it had some caveats. It wasn't just go ahead and go. They said, everything you learn, you need to be able to bring it back and teach it to the other groups within the company. I'm okay with that. Also teach it outside, teach it to our customers. Example of that is this talk today. Explain the challenges we, fit, we, we faced and how we get them, uh, how we overcame them. We also had to agree that if we got, had, could not manage it within the product team, we'd hand it off back to central ops. We'd lose some agility, but we thought that was okay because at the end of the day, what really matters was that the customers who are signed up for the service get the best service possible. So if we couldn't handle it, we'd hand it off and then adhere to the InfoSec policy. That's what we're gonna dive into in a second, but we're gonna take a little bit of a sidebar. And we're gonna talk about the team structure. So when we did this, we were talking about running it purely from a product development team. So a bunch of guys who write code and they're not necessarily used to operations. So what ended up happening was we made a new team and really what that ended up being was that they hired uh, a guy uh, to come in and that was me um, and be the customer inside and do the operations. So I was to represent the customer inside the product team and let them know what was going on and pull, provide feedback. And we ended up being a dynamic team. So I've joked with people, but it is actually true, was while I was running the operations, if something broke, I would walk down the hall and grab the guy who's now grimacing because I did this to him and say, you broke the system, we need to fix it. Come by and we'll sit down and fix it together. Um, and I have to tell you, nothing wakes developers up more to how stable code needs to be when you let them know you will call them at two in the morning if it breaks and they will come help you fix it. Um, they are not used to that. If those folks in the operational world were used to that, phones buzz, you respond, you fix. Um, devs like their nine to five or seven to three or whatever they end up doing. Um, so we, that was the initiation within the team. We changed the team structure um, because we knew our customers were doing the same. They weren't necessarily relying on a dedicated ops team. They weren't doing the traditional, we're gonna build it, toss it over the wall and the ops guys can worry about it. So we really wanted to do it. We wanted to practice what we were preaching. So as a team of one plus whoever, uh, we had a goal and that goal was two commands is one too many. So anything that we did, our initial goal was actually one command was too many, but that wasn't too realistic. Um, so two commands is one too many. So that meant we had to automate everything. We only have a small dedicated resource, um, so we know we can't do everything. If you're doing everything by hand, it just does not scale. It's not gonna work. So um, I really just put this animation in because I wanted to put robots into my talk because I like robots. Um, but it means that we scripted everything. So we can launch the entire service, soup to nuts, with one command. One command line launches all the infrastructure we're gonna talk about today. One command line restores all the infrastructure we're gonna talk today. Um, we built that all in Python on Bodo, and we started doing this before cloud formation got really mature. Um, we've stuck with it because it works and it's flexible. Um, it also has provided us a fantastic way to experiment very, very quickly. So we do not have a traditional uh, permanent test environment or a staging environment. We scale them up as we need it, and then we shut them down afterwards. So we've saved some costs that way, um, and we can also support multiple ones. So we can fire up 10 different staging environments at the exact same time, let people go and test what they need to, and then shut them all down again. So to come back to the meat of today's talk, our policy, let's set that up and we'll see how we, how we fixed our architecture, how we designed our architecture to meet this policy. This is our policy. Well, it's not the real policy, but it's pretty close. I actually wanted to print off a copy of it to bring it today and kind of do the dramatic slam down on the table, um, but I didn't want to carry the extra weight in my carry-on. It was too much. Um, it is a huge policy. Um, we are a global company, so it is, you know, it's available in multiple languages, but our policy is 31 chapters um, long, and it's not like one page a chapter. There are significant chunks of chapters. And quite literally, and I couldn't make this up if I tried, because I tried to figure something light to keep this light, there is an appendix that's entitled Detailed Standards, because 31 chapters wasn't detailed enough. They had to tack on like a 50-page appendix that was detailed. Um, so there's a lot. We had to adhere to a lot of this to make sure that we got the go-ahead. Um, what it boiled down to was about 413 actual requirements that we needed to be able to go to an auditor and say, here's how we meet that requirement, here's evidence that we meet that requirement. A lot of the rest of the policy applied around employee behavior and things like that that was just true no matter where we went. So today we're gonna address these 413. Not one by one, so don't all run for the door. But I'll give you a couple examples of these requirements. So simple ones. Each user must have a unique ID on the system, so nobody shares credentials. That's easy. 
Um, interesting one that's physical, not virtual, uh, or not logical, is uh, delivery and loading areas must be controlled um, and isolated from data processing areas. So your data center design needs to follow best practices, needs to follow SOC 1 practices, things like that. Um, for evidence, records must be kept of who found things, where it was found, the chain of discovery needs to be to kept in there. That's in, this in the policy. Like I said, it's a very in-depth, detailed policy. You need to be able to respond to incidents in a reliable and repeatable manner. Um, you must conduct rehearsals of the business continuity plan. That's a big one that everybody tends to ignore. You set this up to say, this is how I recover from a disaster. We have to test it and prove validation that we've tested it. Um, every user must have one and only one blue sage shoe. Um, that's my Vegas requirement. Not a real requirement, but there are requirements in those 413 that are actually not that far away from that. It gets down to very specific things. But the biggest one for you guys and a good takeaway is that a security champion must be appointed for the project. And that one actually paid huge dividends for us as clients uh, of our information security team. So that we had one guy on the hook who was able to explain what we were doing information security wise, how we were locking things down, how we were addressing our own internal requirements. So if you haven't seen this breakdown yet, um, we'll take two seconds just to cover it. This is the AWS shared security, uh, shared responsibility model for security. This is how security works within the AWS cloud. Um, this is AWS's model. Uh, we'd like to pump it up as much as we can because we feel everybody should be aware of how it works. AWS covers uh, facilities, physical, physical security, virtualization security, the network infrastructure, all that type of thing. Um, that's what we, as users of the service, pay them to secure. They do it very well. Um, they are very transparent of that, and we'll see that in a second. Um, as a client of AWS, so as a client of AWS, I'm responsible for the security of my operating systems, the application, uh, account management, uh, security groups, network configuration. So designing and implementing deep security as a service in the AWS cloud, we had to worry about this right-hand column. This is where we were focused because we knew AWS could cover the left hand for us. Um, and of course, as we've seen from our information security policy for Trend, we actually are concerned about the left-hand column as well. So the first thing we did was we called AWS and we requested a copy of the uh, SOC 1 report. And that covers all the data center facilities, how they manage them, so that crazy loading dock question, that's actually addressed in the report. They got it back to us quickly, uh, less than two days, um, and that actually covered 15% of our requirements right off the bat. So we had now evidence that we could show uh, to our internal auditors to say that, hey, we meet those physical requirements. Um, so everything else had to come from the design. That's what we're gonna talk about now, and actually that's the meat of the rest of the talk. So from a high-level architecture perspective, deep security, and we're gonna do this backwards, um, just because it makes sense when we design it from an architecture perspective, is it starts with an agent. So we have an agent sitting in EC2 that is applying uh, security controls to that operating system, to that instance. Um, it comes down through some communication method and then needs to hit a load balancing layer. So we'll talk about what decisions we made there. Um, then it talks to our manager and relay. That's what our customers actually log into. That's the GUI. That's the, the web console. And then, of course, there's a database backing all that up. So we consider that the manager piece, those three uh, sets of boxes, that's our red box from our initial slide. Then of course we actually support communications both ways. The agent can call in, the manager can call back out. So how do we design this? How do we make the decisions to make this work in AWS securely? If we start with the database layer, um, so we're starting on the, the side of the diagram right from the back and we'll work our way out. Um, we had a couple constraints from the product. So we were taking a technology that is traditionally deployed in the enterprise and deployed in the cloud. It supports uh, MS SQL um, and it supports Oracle. So we had to pick one of those two. We had to stand those up in AWS. Um, we also had a technical requirement that the latency between the path between the manager and the database had to be low. It had to be under two milliseconds. Um, that's the performance uh, metric around how the product was designed and we had to address that moving out into AWS. So. That's our first big roadblock that we hit as we design this, as we're deploying it in AWS, is the latency requirements mean that the DB and the manager actually have to be in the same availability zone. And this is why I said before where we're protecting the innocent and I'm the person you can yell at. Um, how we addressed that is, um, I'll pause while you can boo at me. Um, what we did was we actually put the database and the manager all in the same availability zone. That's the bad part. Um, I told you I'd be honest, open and honest. Our requirements, the way the code is written, is that it has to be in the same availability zone. So for performance reasons, we have to keep them in the same AZ. Now we don't shoot ourselves in the foot that badly, we will address how we fix that. But if you look at it from a logical perspective, if everything is in availability zone A, we have solid performance, we're performing as well as we should. 
if we lose the database in A and it fails over to B, we see a three times performance hit. So an operation that took one minute will now take three. And our customers will notice that in the interface. And that is based on the fact that we legacy code bringing in, and so we needed to address that. But as far as performance, we need to drop them all into the same availability zone. So we, we solved the performance issue by dropping them there. Of course, we created a massive availability problem, but we've solved the performance problem. So we'll address the availability problem in a little bit, but we do that. So our question then for the database was, do we run it ourselves? Do we put it on EC2 and we run uh, the MSSQL, the Oracle database in the operating system? Um, it meets our requirements, so it's running, it's there. Um, for us, we don't want to uh, have a single availability, um, so we want to run it in a cluster, which means we're going to be uh, paying for two boxes at least, if not more, right? So if we stand up a cluster in EC2, we're paying for every box. And it's more maintenance, because for every box we stand up, we have to maintain it. We have to patch it, we have to secure it, we have to keep it up to date, we have to back it up. Um, so it works, and it's fine, and we actually designed the service and have deployed it with uh, Amazon EC2, but we also looked at Amazon RDS. So again, it meets our requirements. It supports MSSQL, it supports Oracle. Um, a very nice thing for the budget was that it, for a clustered pair, so for a multi-AZ RDS instance, um, it's only a 30% bump. So instead of paying double the price by standing up two instances, you're only adding 30% to your cost. And for my personal one, and you'll see this again and again, less effort, that's a big win. We have a small team with RDS. All they give us is a database endpoint to connect to. We don't have to manage the underlying OS. We don't have to manage patching the uh, server itself. We don't have to manage patching Oracle or, or Microsoft SQL. They handle that as part of the service. So we're getting less effort from us for less cost to give us the same thing. So we chose RDS. So the question still remains, do we go with MSSQL or do we go with Oracle? For MSSQL, our development teams were more familiar with it. And the reason for that was simply because most of our customers run it. So we focused most of our resources on optimizing the code for MSSQL. We have better tools available, and I don't mean that globally as far as there are better tools for MSSQL. That's a debate that will set DBAs against each other. Um, but we had better development, better tools within our dev shop because that's what we were focused on. So availability of tools, we had better stuff for us. But we hit a major limit when we went to RDS, was that RDS has a limit uh, of 30 databases per RDS instance. So every time a customer signs up with our service, we have a strong isolation model for their data and we actually spin them up another database. So we keep it on the same instance, but it's another logical database within MSSQL. Um, that was fine, but the problem was within RDS, for every 31st customer that signed up, we had to stand up a whole new RDS instance. And if you've looked at RDS pricing, standing up the instances can be quite expensive. So very quickly, at this point, we're just shy of 600 customers on the service. If you divide that out by the 30, we'd have a ton of databases, and our budget would have gone up. So we looked at Oracle. Oracle, we will politely say, forces product improvements. Um, because we, are, uh, focused, we were focused on MSSQL, by putting the service and putting production workloads on Oracle, we had to focus very quickly and pivot and start optimizing the back end of Oracle. Uh, our back end to Oracle, I should say. Um, that's why it encourages learning, um, because we had no choice. Customers are relying on it. We had to dive into it as well, which was great. And the big benefit for us on RDS was there's no limit for table spaces. So a little sidebar, Oracle doesn't fire up a separate database like MSSQL does. It has a concept called a table space, which is essentially the same thing. But in RDS, they don't have a limit on the number of table spaces you can uh, fire up. Now, according to the team, it's actually due to backup why they have that limit. MSSQL itself, if you stood it up, does not have a 30 database limit. It's just the implementation in RDS to make sure that they can guarantee backups fast enough. So we chose Oracle uh, on RDS. And the reason being, as we've already covered, was uh, minimal cost for clustering. Um, automated backups, which was huge. So we maxed out the backup time. Um, so we get granular backups up to five minutes. We can restore over the course of a month um, or back to at least a month. Um, five, any point in time, five minutes back up with one API command. Um, and that's a huge boost for us. So that requirement of being able to prove that we can restore the service, we can do it with that scripting because we can say, you know what, yesterday at 12.02, restore the database to the time to 12.02, and it pops back up. So for the information security policy, this met our backup and, requ and uh, um, recovery procedure. Um, so we recovered there. And in fact, we can recover the service in less than an hour. Now, we gave ourselves an hour, but consistently in testing, it's 35 minutes. And a good chunk of that is RDS. It tends to be 28 to 33 minutes or so. Um, and it's everything EC2 after that is super quick. So we have a really simple recovery method. 
And you never see that in the enterprise. Trying to restore something that fast in the enterprise, we have that own challenge internally. Um, but in AWS, the, because we have the API access, we've been uh, enabled to be able to recover quickly. And we've seen it in action when we test it. We do actually test it regularly. So that's the database. If we move forward in the uh, design model, we'll talk about our manager node. So this is what, if you log into the service, this is what you actually see. Um, so we had some choices here, but the requirements were, was the deep security, uh, the manager is a JVM-based uh, application. So it runs on the Java virtual machine. And its constraints are around memory, CPU, and network. So we don't do a lot of I.O. to the disk because we go back to the database all the time. So CPU and memory were pretty straightforward. Um, network, where we are is we're not very chatty outward. And um, what we do is a lot of small communications, but we have a large number of com uh, concurrent communications. So when you think about every agent that's out there needs to talk back to the manager. When you're supporting thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of agents, if they're all talking back at the same time, while they may only be doing 30 or 40 kilobytes of data exchange, you still have to support 100,000 concurrent connections. So those were the constraints we were looking at um, when we started to pick how we were gonna deploy this out in uh, AWS. So we could support on Windows because JVM will run on Windows. Um, that met our requirements, um, but it was a lot harder to script. If any of you guys in the audience have tried to script uh, automate stuff through PowerShell, it'll work. Um, you'll probably be, you know, your hairline's gonna recede quite a bit. Yeah, I'm getting the maybe, it'll kind of work. Um, it theoretically works, um, and we did actually successfully deploy it that way, um, uh, but it's hard. So we were making extra work for ourselves by deploying it on Windows, and it was more expensive um, because we had the increased instance cost that included the license. So we looked at Amazon Linux. Um, again, it met our requirements. Uh, we're a big Linux shop, so it met our uh, simple scripting, and it was cheaper for us. So we ended up going with uh, Amazon Linux. But this brings us back to that little boo-boo earlier uh, where we have everything in the same availability zone. So how do can we, that's got our performance solved by dropping it all in the same availability zone. But how do we fix that um, availability and that, uh, that uh, service issue out to our customers? Well, what we actually do is we use a bit of a trick and we use auto scaling. So when we deployed the service out, we weren't sure how it was gonna scale. So we thought about deploying auto scaling right off the bat and said, you know what, if there's enough network connections, move it up. But we did some research and we ran through a lot of testing. We found over time, we actually scale uh, for the manager, it actually scales quite logically and it's very linear. So we don't have to worry about rapid boosts. We know when we're gonna have to stand up a new server about two weeks in advance. Um, so it's not a huge need for us to actually enable auto scaling. It's not like a website when you know uh, you, that your load during prime time may go up and it may drop down again later. So we don't need dynamic elastic scaling, but what we actually do is we cheat and we use auto scaling to handle the availability zone failover. So our auto scaling group is actually locked to the number of instances. Our min and our max are the exact same. And what we do is we spread it across multiple availability zones so that if one AZ goes down, it'll automatically fail over and bring up the same number of nodes in another AZ. So if we go back to our logical diagram, everything's running in availability zone A. We're good, performance is fine, we don't have an issue. If A goes offline, our RDS instance will automatically recover into B, and the auto scaling group handles creating those new instances for us in the other availability zones. So we still see a three times performance hit because we've got split availability zones, but the difference is we haven't lost service. So for the product, the loss of service from the manager is not a critical failure, it's a perception failure because the agent does all the heavy lifting, all the security controls and protection are still in place for your EC2 instances, but you can't spin up new ones with protection because they can't talk to the manager to register. So we still wanna make sure that the manager is highly available. By leveraging this little trick with auto scaling, we're okay with taking a performance hit because we haven't gone down. And that's a good trade-off. We didn't, we didn't fail, we just slowed down for a bit. And of course, you know, my phone goes insane and I get up and we start trying to figure out a way to fix things. Uh, but our customers don't lose service, uh, which was a huge boost for us. So the second thing I wanted to talk about, and this is something that's actually a constant debate within the team, is AMIs. We actually, uh, maintaining an AMI is additional effort, right? It's not a huge amount of additional effort, but it's additional effort, and if you haven't figured out by now when I'm talking, we try to avoid effort. We're a small team, everything that we can script and automate, the better. So we actually don't use an AMI for the service. We take a vanilla uh, flavor of Amazon Linux, spin it up and dynamically configure it on the fly. Um, we can do that because we only have one type of server, right? We just have that one server that's a manager and a relay. So we, on the fly, come in 
and we spin up all the configurations we need, we install the software, it only takes about 30 seconds after the boot. So it's rapid, it's fast, we don't lose anything. And what it does is we actually re regularly test that deployment to ensure that it still works. Because if there's a background change for Amazon Linux, um, it, we may not have the same, the script may fail. But we test that regularly. And the reason why we do this is it actually keeps us on the ball. Because we've automated everything to such a point where we don't have to really sit there and monitor because we get uh, pinged if there's an issue, by making sure that we de deploy on the fly like this, we actually have to keep looking in and keep diving in. Which was an interesting thing, because I didn't think that'd actually be a problem. You know, ignoring the service is not really a big issue. Um, you know, if you've gotten to the point where it's so stable you don't have to worry about it, that's normally a good thing. Um, but because we automated everything and it just automatically fails over, so that failover scenario you've seen uh, with the uh, auto-scaling group, we've actually tried, well, I'll say we tried that, uh, but we actually had the AZ go down twice over the last year, and it was just a blip. We did not lose service at all. Um, so we know it works. So we know that there's very few instances where somebody's gonna get out of bed to go fix something from the infrastructure perspective. So by not having an AMI where we know it's always gonna be the same thing and having to test it every couple days, we keep, on, we keep on, it's a little sort of human feedback loop to make sure that we're on the ball to make sure that things are going. So we do have this discussion every week though. Should we go back to an AMI? We have one just in case. Um, but for now, we're just building it all on the fly, which is fun. So we don't use AMIs. Um, and we auto-scale only for failover. So that's a, that was an interesting thing, because we thought we, when we first designed this that we'd have to actually auto-scale to support capacity, but because it's that linear scale, we just use it for failover. So the last piece of the infrastructure that I want to talk about is the load balancers. So a lot of people just say, okay, this is short chat, we can just say ELB and we're done. Um, but we actually put a lot of thought into this. Because we need a high level of concurrency, we looked at some options. And for us, we looked at HA proxy to start with. If you're not familiar with, uh, or actually I should tell you the requirements first, my apologies. Um, we have three flows that income to the service. We have the user flow, we have the agent flow, and uh, we also have an update flow. So we have the flow where you as a manager log into the console to see what's going on. We have the agent calling in to see if it needs additional tasks. And we have the update flow that's on a separate channel. Um, they all are incoming on 443. Um, and then we want to offload the SSL if we can. So we don't want to manage the certificates on the managers. We want to manage them on our load balancing layer just for operational ease. Um, and as we've discussed a few times, we have a high number, uh, need a high number of concurrent connections. So we looked at HA Proxy. So HA Proxy is an open source project. It's a fantastic load balancer. Depending on your needs, it could be the right solution. Reason I like it is the documentation looks like it was written in the 1980s. It's all ASCII with like really horrible animated GIFs at the top. Um, but it's a great product, it meets our requirements, but again, it came down to the challenge, if we stood up HA Proxy on our own, we'd need to have at least two more, two more instances for high availability, if not three or four, and we'd have to manage them. So we'd be paying for the EC2 instance costs, and we'd have these more boxes to maintain. So we looked at the ELBs, we looked at the elastic load balancers. They could meet our requirements. The downside is, we'd have to fire up three of them. So for, the, for quite a while, and thankfully they fixed it about nine months ago, was that your ELB for your auto-scaling group would only tie into one ELB. Now you can tie into multiple ELBs. So we used to have a custom script that would actually auto-register with ELB. Now we can just leverage the native AWS functionality. But we do need three ELBs. And the reason for that is those three user flows, the three flows into the uh, service, the agent coming in, the user uh, addressing the console, and then the update flow. And we use subdomains to uh, push those to different ELBs. And they're all answering on port 443. And we wanted it all 443 incoming because it was significantly easier to com uh, communicate out to people how to set it up so that the service would work. As long as you could hit Google on HTTPS, you could use the service. Really simple for support purposes. So with the ELBs, had the nice uh, benefit of them being inexpensive. Um, they're not nearly the same price as an EC2 instance, and they were minimal maintenance because they are a service. So we ended up going with elastic load balancers. So our final ish design, and I say ish because we constantly reevaluate it. We started with this design, and what we ended up being uh, finalizing for now is that we've, our load balancing layer is now ELBs. Our manager layer is an auto scaling group running on EC2 on Amazon Linux. And our back end database is a multi availability zone uh, series of Oracle RDS instances. And this has been extremely successful for us. So in addition to those core services, we have some supporting services from AWS that we use. So the first one that we do use is Amazon Route 53. So when I said we were all in for AWS, we were all in for AWS. 
We have, obviously, our own DNS services running on our own uh, data centers. We use uh, Route 53 for this project. Um, and at first, it was simply just because we wanted to say we were all in. Um, but we've actually found a significant amount of benefit from it. So we mentioned earlier that we don't have permanent test environments. We don't have permanent staging environments. What we did for those environments was that we actually spin them up and assign them a DNS name automatically through the API with Route 53, and then we have a wildcard SSL cert for those test environments so that it is a, an exact replica of our production environment. It is the exact same thing, it's just under a different set of domain names. So Route 53 enabled us to do that because it provides you the same level of API access as all the rest of the AWS services. With our own internal DNS, we didn't have that. When we mentioned to the, D the guys who host our DNS internally that we wanted to make a dynamic changes on the fly, let's just say they were not happy, and that was not a good conversation. So we moved to our, uh, Route 53, and we've seen a lot of success for it. Um, obviously, we use S3 as well. We deploy all our binaries and all our configurations from private S3 buckets. Um, but we also use Trusted Advisor. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Trusted Advisor, basically it pulls up with some recommended configurations, um, checks your configurations, and we use it sort of as a sanity check to make sure that we haven't shot ourselves in the foot, that a group isn't open to the world that shouldn't be open to the world, that we are not have instances that are running that we're not actually having use on. So it'll pull up and say, you know what, this, sir, this instance is running and its CPU never bumps above 1%. You should probably shut it down and move that workload somewhere else. So it's been pretty good for us. Um, now, this, may, this piece may sound like a bit of a sales pitch, and I apologize for that, but being on the front line, having premium support for AWS has saved my bacon quite a few times. Um, that gives us the ability to open an urgent ticket, and they can answer questions back. Um, during outages, we can pick up the phone and call somebody. Um, and also, what was very handy was for questions around how they've uh, configured Amazon Linux, they'll actually provide the answer from the development team for you. So that's been quite successful for us. So that, in a nutshell, is the technical design. Um, so it's, we've made some interesting choices. You've heard why we've had to make them. But what I wanted to share with you here in the, in the last 20 minutes is what that's meant to us um, as a team and as a company as well. So what results have we gotten out of this? What have we done? Uh, what have we accomplished by standing up this service? It's been running for a year in production, and we soft launched it last year at reInvent. We launched it on the booth. We were inviting people to try it. And that was actually um, pre-release code from our traditional. So we're still in the meat of the um, changeover for R&D guys. Um, so we were running uh, pre-release code at that time, but it's been stable for a year. So what did we do? Well, no surprise since I'm giving this talk, we actually met our information security requirements. Um, we met all 413 of them, and we can provide audit evidence to our information security group that we meet them and we regularly check that we meet them. Um, our, my biggest surprise, personally, I used to, before I joined Trend, I worked for the Canadian federal government, and so, you know, you want to see paperwork and audit trail, go to government department and you'll see it. That's just universal. That's a global thing that we all share. Um, my biggest surprise was how easy it was to actually meet the audit. So when we developed all of our custom scripts, the one thing we did that was, you know, I'd like to say it was planned, but it was just kind of a happy circumstance, was that they all output to uh, audit uh, verifiable logs to say that, you know, it was deployed at 802, Mark did the deployment, this is what happened. That, as audit evidence, has been huge for us. So that was a nice, pleasant surprise, was that our, we have nice chats with our internal auditors. That was kind of weird. They're really nice guys when they're not breathing over your neck saying, give me this, give me this, give me this. So we have a really positive relationship with the audit team, which is fantastic. So for our customers, what it means is over the last year, we've handled more than 20 million security events. That's a pretty big number. That's, uh, we're pretty happy with that. Um, in addition, what we've seen is an additional 10% growth every month. So every month, we're getting 10% more customers on the service. We're seeing a huge pickup for it. Um, that's great. That's exciting. It's nice to know that we've deployed something that's stable enough that people trust. So for cost size, so I know it's a technical talk, but I had to say this because inevitably, if you can answer back to the finance guys with a positive thing, it makes it easier to get away with some advanced technical stuff and something that might be out of pe people's comfort zones. So when we started this project, we actually got a quote internally of how much it would cost to stand it up in our own data centers. We beat that. We're 63% cheaper on AWS. But the biggest boost from a technical perspective is we've got 15 times the performance by the design we deployed on AWS than what we would have gotten internally. And a lot of that goes back to the RDS. Uh, for RDS, we, have, um, we use um, PIOPS, so the Guaranteed Performance IOPS. We lock that in, and we see a huge boost in performance. So we did it cheaper, and we did it better. That's a good thing. Back to the technical side. Our uptime. So we've got three numbers for uptime, because I want to be perfectly honest with you. After one year, our AWS uptime has been five nines. 
Not bad for a team of a couple people, right? Um, it would have been seven, but we had two blips with the availability zones and the way RDS multi-AZ failover works, while you have a clustered pair, the DNS actually takes time to switch over to the backup. So we lost about two minutes one time and about a minute and a half the other and that dropped our nine. I was, I'm always disappointed when you look at how fine that number is between seven nines and five nines. It's like, yeah, you got five minutes, you got six minutes, okay, I can't even get a coffee that fast. And if you drop below that, you go down to the five nines. But our AWS pieces, we obviously picked the right designs because we've been able to have it up for five nines. So the second number you see here is the application uptime if you exclude maintenance windows. So stuff we planned for. So because we were uh, deploying uh, beta code early and then went to production code and then do uh, regular maintenance window upgrades, um, if you plan for those in the availability calculation, we've done uh, 99.998. So our goal was uh, 99.95 and we've beaten that, um, which is great but it excludes the maintenance windows. So if you include the maintenance windows, we drop below our goal. So we actually didn't reach our goal for the year for uptime. And that was lessons learned. We figured out a few things that didn't work in the cloud with the latency, um, with a few availability issues, things like that. Um, so we're getting there, we're learning. But one thing that I wanted to mention actually was a positive win. So when this product, because it was an enterprise product that we moved into the cloud, um, one of the things that was never really calculated for was no downtime. Enterprise customers, by and large, tend to have a Saturday night maintenance window. Things go down, they've got a four hour window on Saturday night, they can do their upgrades. So to upgrade the manager product, you actually had to down it and it would take a couple hours to upgrade and off you'd go. For a cloud service deployment, that doesn't work. You can't email every constituent on the service. I can't email 600 people and say, hey, I'm gonna down the console for four hours this week and uh, again next week and again the week after that. That doesn't work. So the first time and why this number is at uh, the uh, 90, or 99944 there um, is because the first couple times we did a maintenance window and we saw the performance, it took about two hours the first time. And then the next time we did a maintenance window, it took about three hours. And that was because the way we had written the code was that the more customers we had on the service, the longer it took to do the upgrade. It was actually a linear function that uh, for every customer we added, it added about five or six minutes to the upgrade window. So we did the math and we figured by the end of the year, given that the growth rate, it would take about five and a half hours to do a standard basic maintenance window upgrade where everything went well. So you can imagine that conversation with your customers. Thank you for being a customer of our service. We're gonna down this thing for almost a whole day to do an upgrade. And the reason why that's gonna take so long is because we were successful. It's not a good chat. That's not a good conversation to have. So where this ended up being a big win was that with the product team, we went right back and said, look, we've had these last two maintenance windows, look at this linear scaling, this is gonna kill us by the end of the year. So they went back and they, in their, so they've switched to an agile methodology, and we'll talk about that uh, a bit in a second. And over the next sprint, they, they worked really hard, and they pushed that down, and then when the next maintenance window they, we did, so we were at oh, just shy of three hours for the, the previous window, the maintenance window we did next was 18 minutes. So they took it down from three hours in two weeks down to an 18 minute maintenance window. And they're working to make it even faster, and they're working to make it transparent. And unfortunately, he's taking a photo of me as I'm doing that. And hopefully, Kevin, you take that back to the product team and say, he promised we're gonna make it transparent. But I thought that was a huge win. The product team looked at it and said, you know what, we saw this was fine in the enterprise, in the cloud, that doesn't work. We can't down for hours. So they've got it down to 18 minutes. So hopefully, when you talk to us next year, all these numbers are five nines. All these numbers are seven nines. So another big win we had back talking to the product team was in addition to our regular QA cycle, we found an additional 66 bugs by deploying the service. So this is stuff that our normal QA cycle missed. And I'd love to tell you that our QA cycle and everybody else's QA cycle is perfect, but the reality is this is software, it's a complex beast, um, you miss stuff. So most of these bugs were tiny, but seven of them were really big uh, threading or edge case bugs. So for those of you who aren't a developer, a threading bug or an edge case, you know, something edge case or a threading or timing bug is a scenario where you've got a lot of moving parts. So it's almost impossible to replicate. So you said, well, I've got 1,000 customers on this server and 3,000 customers on this server, and it happened to be an RDS patch window where they were updating the database so the load was higher and the overall network usage was up. There's no way you can replicate an issue like that in your development environment. It's only stuff you see live. So this is stuff that traditionally before we had the service, we would only hear about third hand, we would have zero data, and it would just be like, yeah, it doesn't work when there's a big load, you know, it hits this kind of a problem. 
by having the service run right out of the product team, we had all the logs, all the visibility, we could put an extra debugging on the service to find out what was going on, and we were able to nail seven of these really complicated bugs, and I'm sure there's more coming, but we nailed seven of them, which was a fantastic win. Everyone was extremely excited about that. Then we talked about the performance increase as well. So by using RDS uh, by Oracle, we've had a big boost in the uh, performance for those customers. So questions get asked around about how fast it took us. How fast did we get this up and running? Well, the initial test deployment we had in less than a month. Um, so when we decided we were go on AWS, we actually stood it up in less than a month. And that's not just taking the enterprise big conglomeration of boxes and dropping it in AWS. We had sort of an AWS tuned one within a month. And it was using our own EC2 instances for the database and all that. And we've evolved it. it took us one uh, FTE to run over the year to explore uh, AWS and learn about it. And we leveraged perform, uh, premier support as we needed as we went along. Back to the product team. Big change here. Our release cadence is changing. Um, it used to be once a year to match our enterprise customers. We had one big major release, and then we'd have updates and patches and service packs throughout the year. Um, right now, we're on a track for four medium-sized releases, which is great, um, and that's getting faster and faster. But the big boost for us was for the agent. So our agent, you know, it does the network, uh, it does firewalling and intrusion prevention. To do that, it needs to wrap tightly around the kernel. Um, the problem with that, while Windows does slow kernel updates, if you're an Amazon Linux user, you've probably noticed that your kernel is updating on average every two weeks. Um, for a, a driver, for a binary that wraps around that kernel and needs that compatibility, that's really tough. In the enterprise, what we'd see with like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, customers are really strict around what kernel goes out live. And they may update their kernel once or twice a year. For users in AWS, they're just deploying whatever the latest one is all the time. So we had to change how we actually build the agent, how we maintain the agent. And we went from doing one or four agent updates a year, depending on what was going on, to we're able to update the agent within 24 hours. And unfortunately slash fortunately, we had an example of that in the boot camp we held on Tuesday. Tuesday mid-morning, AWS revved the kernel for Amazon Linux. I was teaching a class in front of 90 students and sitting there going, well, they've got a new kernel and we have a kernel-based binary. After the lunch break, we had an updated agent. And the only reason we've been able to accomplish that is because we've taken that process from an internal structure and actually push it into AWS. So we do the binary building and the testing within AWS as well. And because we've automated that, we've been able to increase that speed and it's really been a big success for us. We're still working on it. Um, you know, who knew? Change is really hard, uh, but we're still getting there. So development has had a big change as we go through this. So this is a little tooting, my own, tooting our own horn. Um, internally, the way we've set this up is now the standard within Trend for new services. The question within Trend that gets asked when somebody starts to stand up a new service is your AWS first unless you can justify it otherwise. And that's based on the success that the team has had with Deep Security as a service. So that's a great win. We set the standard for disaster recovery. So we mentioned that we do most of it in half an hour. Um, the company standard is now an hour and a half for every service regardless of where it is. We got to sit on that meeting and we, you know, they were like, can everybody commit to an hour and a half recovery time for all of those services? We kind of snickered and we said, sure, we can do an hour and a half. I think if we work really hard, you give us some extra money, we might be able to hit an hour and a half for you. We laughed too hard and they said, why are you laughing? We're like, damn it, well, we should, we're not good at poker. You want to win some money, hit me at the poker table because apparently I don't have a poker face. So we owned up and we told them, we said, look, we leveraged the following features in AWS and we were able to get our, our recovery back in about 35 minutes, but we'll commit to an hour instead of an hour and a half. Then the other big win is that we've been able to keep deriving stuff back into the product. So what we've flipped with our R&D, we've been able to go from that enterprise cadence, that once a year, um, to a service first based model. So for our features, so we launched a new feature uh, that we showed yesterday in a demo with JD, um, was that we have uh, the ability to leverage Amazon EC2 tags um, and make policy decisions within deep security. Right now, that's a feature that's only on Deep Security as a Service because we could stand it up, we developed it, we tested it, we made sure it was ready for prime time, we dropped it on the service. Our enterprise customers are gonna get that in another couple weeks because they're used to that cadence. So we hit the next enterprise release and we drop the features that we've built and tested and proven on the service. We'll give those to our enterprise customers. So we're leading the way with the service. We've been able to pull that off in a year, which frankly, you know, was, that's, that's a big boost because that's a huge cultural shift. To take a team of 50 some people who are used to doing one big release every year and saying, you know what, now we're gonna take it, we're gonna wrap it up into smaller functionality and when it works, we're gonna push it live to customers. 
And then when that's done and ready, we'll, you know, every certain amount of time, we'll take all those features that are working and drop them into the enterprise release. That was a massive flip of the way that we normally do things. And it was really nice to see everybody jump on board with that. And in fact, the development team is excited now because when they build something, now it's live, right? They build something and they're working hard on something for two weeks or for four weeks. Then it goes out and it actually gets in the hands of customers. Whereas previously in the enterprise model, it was they'd build it, it would, and they'd test it and it would sit there and it would wait for the next big release. So if they missed that big release deadline, if it wouldn't get into, if it was a major feature, they'd have to wait a long time. So they've been excited about that. So that, in a nutshell, is what we've done. Um, it's been a huge success for us. Um, we've been really excited about it, um, you know, but it, it wasn't smooth. <laughs> we didn't think it would be smooth, but um, you know, it worked out. We encountered problems along the way. Um, we're continuing to make changes, but we're continuing to find issues, and we're continuing to find a way around it. But at the end of the day, what's really enabled us um, to move forward is that everybody got on board, everybody was in, um, and we've been able to leverage our partnership with AWS to provide a really good service to our customers um, and to do it with the minimum amount of resources internally, which is really exciting. So we'll wrap that up. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take questions publicly. If not, you can find me on Twitter at MarkNCA. This afternoon at 1 o'clock, we'll be doing a Twitter chat live from the floor. Um, so you can jump online, MarkNCA, or hashtag TrendTalk. Um, more than happy to take your questions now, privately after the session or during the talk.